just a quick warning, the subject matter of the story could be considered sensitive to some viewers, and as such, viewer discretion is advised. The story of Mr. Cruel is a very interesting one, and what he did were horrible, horrible acts. Uh, and if you are not willing or wanting to listen to stories that involve a potential child predator, this is not the one for you. Just a heads up. Uh, the story is not detailed or uh, really grotesque or gory or anything like that, but it is hinted at. And again, the story of Mr. Cruel, the actual like uh, Wikipedia level story, is just horrible. So, um, again, viewer discretion advised, and I hope that uh, you enjoy the video. Thank you. Hi, fellow Redditors. Not too sure if this is even where I should be, or even if I should be posting this. It's been on my mind for many decades now, at least 30 plus years, and it has always terrified me. Although I have no definitive evidence, the coincidences are just too... much. To start with, I'm only mentioning all of this because I know it's anonymous. And if it wasn't, there is no way I would even consider mentioning any of this in a public forum. I grew up in an extremely abusive household. My mother displayed narcissistic personality disorder. My stepfather is a pedophile, and his oldest son is an alcoholic, a compulsive liar, and is also a pedophile. Sadly, I know this from first-hand experience. And I also know that I am not the only person that was afflicted by their attentions. My mother did nothing about the situation. In fact, she often deliberately put me in compromising positions, leaving me in their custody, or turning a blind eye when she had undeniable evidence that something had occurred. Although this group is about unsolved murders, and not other forms of abuse, this will all make sense, as it is all intertwined. When I was about 11 years old, I lived in the state of Tasmania in Australia. My eldest stepbrother had moved interstate to Victoria to join the army, and I was just relieved for the break from his presence. When he completed his basic training, my stepfather and my mother went for a trip to Victoria to watch my stepbrother march out which is a ceremony at the end of their training to signify that they were now full-serving members of the Defense Force. They were gone interstate for approximately a two-week period. My dates are not 100% accurate, but they were gone from about late August to somewhere mid-September. I remember this clearly, because once they came back to Tasmania, they had nothing but praise about mainland Australia. Tasmania is an island state, and they wanted to move there. We were packed and ready to move very fast, and were gone in just over two weeks after their return. We arrived in Melbourne on the 5th of October, 1987. Not long after we moved to Melbourne, there was an awful case on the news about a man who was abducting young girls from their homes and abusing them. One of his last victims, that I was aware of, was a young girl named Carmen Chan. Although I was so young at the time, and often ignored whatever stories were on the news of nighttime, this stuck with me, because we often ate dinner with the television on at the same time, Whenever something came on the news about Carmen Chan and the abductor that the media had dubbed Mr. Cruel, my stepfather would snap at me and insist that I shut up and keep quiet while he listened. He would turn the television up louder and became very focused on whatever the news was reporting. Mr. Cruel had abducted a few girls leading up to this point and had mostly just assaulted them before he left them somewhere where they could be discovered and returned to their families. In Carmen Chan's case, however, she was never returned, and eventually was found deceased. 
my stepfather's abnormally intense interest in the news surrounding these cases always confused me, as he most certainly did not concern himself with my welfare, and there was plenty of violent news on television for him to absorb, so I had no idea why he was so interested in Mr. Cruel. He did have some other peculiar interests, as he used to own a collection of booklets printed about serial killers in our home library. I did not read them all, as I was too young and really had no interest in the subject at the time, but I remember a book about Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy, etc. Of course, it's not illegal to possess on its own, not entirely suspicious, but if you combine it with the rest of my post, then perhaps it will appear to be a little dubious. Anyways, it wasn't until I was much older that I started to question as to why my stepfather seemed so interested in Mr. Cruel at the time. That's when I started to read up on what little information the police had on the criminal slash murderer. They believed that he was in the defense force. I think because of the way he was so clean and left behind no evidence, or minimal evidence. At the time of these abductions and murders, my stepbrother was in the army, but my stepfather was also a manic, neat freak. He would make me wash the hubcaps of the car with a toothbrush when I was cleaning the car, and one day he even went on a meltdown because I left a tiny ink mark on the front page of a newspaper while I was checking to see if a pen was working. His tidiness was a compulsion. The one piece of physical evidence that Mr. Cruel had apparently left behind was a whisker. So the police thought they were looking for a redhead because the whisker was red. Both my stepfather and my stepbrother are brunette, unless they grow facial hair. They both have red facial hair. The police also thought that their subject was from either Tasmania or New Zealand due to some of the colloquialisms in the language that the abducted girls heard. I cannot recall the exact phrase that was released to the media, I just know that when I read it at the time, I recognized it as something my stepfather and stepbrother often used. They often used colloquialisms such as, how do you like them apples, or how does that grab you, in a sadistic, condescending tone. This is just a couple of the many that they used. Also, at the time of the abductions and abuse slash murder, all the victims were female, and all of them were the same age as myself. Lastly, the last coincidence that comes to mind at the moment is the timeline. From what I read in the media, they believe that the first abductions from Mr. Cruel occurred sometime in either late August to mid-September 1987. I cannot recall the exact date. I just remember how ill it made me to feel that both my stepfather and stepbrother were both in Victoria at the time this happened, and the last victim they believe Mr. Cruel abducted was either in September or very early October in 1992. These dates are important because, against my wishes and against my stepfather's wishes, my mother insisted we move back to Tasmania, and we left Victoria on October the 5th of 1992, just after Mr. Cruel's last apparent abduction before he went quiet in Victoria. Around the same time that we moved back to Tasmania, my stepbrother moved from Victoria to Queensland. So now, both my stepfather and my stepbrother were no longer in Victoria. Although, both of them had been there during the times that Mr. Cruel was active. Both my stepbrother and stepfather have a sadistic streak, and I honestly believe that after living with them for 13 years, that either one of them was quite capable of doing those acts. My stepbrother was, however, a little skittish and anxious when he was being abusive, but my stepfather always kept his composure. At the times that Mr. Cruel was active, we lived in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, 
which is where Carmen Chan's body was found, and so did my stepbrother. Her body was found only a couple of suburbs away from where we resided. My stepfather does not appear to fit the physical description of Mr. Cruel, as he is quite short, but my stepbrother does. It would not even surprise me if they acted, if it was them of course, as a pair, because each of them knew the other's fetish-slash-sadistic behaviors, and each of them covered for the other. At the time that Mr. Cruel was active, I would also like to note that at least one of his victims stated they could hear airplanes overhead when they were abducted. We lived in the northern suburbs of Melbourne at the time, not too far from an international airport, and underneath the flight path of many of the flights. Also, one of the descriptions of a room that one of the girls was kept in matches up with what I can remember from one of my stepbrother's rooms when he was living out of our home for a while. My stepbrother never lived on barracks when we moved to Melbourne. He either rented his own place or moved back in with us for a while. The only time I recall that he lived on a base was just before we moved back to Tasmania. At this time, he was married and was working as a chef at a communications depot. Because this depot was so small and in a rural area, and because he was married, he was provided a house on the depot site to live in with his wife at the time. Because he was the chef and the depot was so small, he was the only chef that I was aware of. So, it was essential that he be available on site to cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So, living on the depot was pretty essential. I also recall his really odd behavior, which may not have anything to do with this case, but it was not uncommon to find him vacuuming his house or hanging washing out the back to dry at one in the morning. This may have something to do with him being a chef and working hours that were different than most, just getting household chores done when he could, but he was also an extreme neat freak and I hated spending time there to keep his wife company, because as I was 16 years old, I did not appreciate being woken up to help vacuum or hang washing up so late at night. I mentioned all of this to a police officer years ago. All I can recall was that she was part of a task force at the time. She did ask me to get back with her, but I had a house fire and I lost her contact details. Since then, I've never been able to locate them again, and I have no idea what her name was. I really just don't remember, although I honestly wish I did. I truly believe that one of them, if not both of them, were involved in this whole Mr. Cruel incident. It terrifies me to think that perhaps their dislike for me, or their passion to be sadistic towards me, is possibly why they chose targets that were brunette and of the same age as myself. There's a saying in Australia, which is, you don't crap where you eat. Which means if you're going to commit a crime, you don't do it in your backyard because it's just too close to your home. So, the thought of them lashing out at these young ladies instead of myself is just sickening. Of course, I have no definite proof on me. Or they or he would certainly be in prison as I type this. Obviously, I have nothing to do with them at all anymore. Whenever I was abused, it was either psychological and sadistic, which is just impossible to prove to authorities unless there is a non-biased witness, or the abuse never left any marks on my body, which again is pretty difficult to prove. My mother once told me when I was 14 that if I ever went to the police, she would lie. And then she asked me who I thought a judge would believe, her or a teenage girl. I was terrified to go to the authorities because I honestly thought no one would believe me. And then the aftermath would be much, much worse for me. Since then, however, I have had my stepbrother charged and he did end up spending some time in jail for some of the crimes committed against me, 
although most of them have gone unpunished. I don't hold any malice about that, and I'm impressed that the Victorian police were able to put together a case on what information they had, and that they were able to charge him at all. This does not alleviate my concerns about the Mr. Cruel case, though. There are so many coincidences that I find frightening. One, the intense interest in the media coverage of the cases. Two, all the victims being the same age and same hair color as myself. Three, living in the approximate area where he was committing the crimes. Four, their facial hair being the same as the sample found at the crime scenes. Five, their colloquialisms that matched Mr. Cruel's pattern of speech. Six, the time frames that Mr. Cruel was committing his crimes matched the times that both of my family members were in Victoria. Seven, living in the northern suburbs, we lived close to the international airport and underneath the flight path of airplanes. Eight, my stepfather's compulsion for tidiness and my stepbrother being in the army at the time of Mr. Cruel's active spree. Nine, Mr. Cruel's activity seeming to cease when both my stepfather and stepbrother moved interstate from Victoria. Ten, my stepfather's fascination with serial killers. And eleven, my family coming from Tasmania as the police believed that Mr. Cruel was either Tasmanian or from New Zealand. This is an awful lot of coincidences concerning one case, or one offender. I guess all of these coincidences don't really amount to a criminal case, but it has left me feeling ill, terrified, and with no one to talk to about this. I did try to mention it to my biological father once, a few years ago, but I think he just thought perhaps I was overreacting and he was not aware of the abuse I had endured as a child. I had never told him about any of this. Even when my stepbrother was charged and went to jail, my biological father had no idea why and no idea that my mother was aware, and that his father was also a part of it. I can't shake the horrible feeling that I feel like I was raised by a serial abuser. Well, that one I know is a certainty and a murderer, who had no problem in taking the life of a young girl. I know that either of them are capable of such actions, although if I was asked to choose which one I thought it would most likely be, the physical attributes match my stepbrother, but the calmness of Mr. Cruel was something that was more often displayed by my stepfather, so I really don't know. But I'm very sure that one of them, if not both of them, were involved in this case. I just don't know who to approach, who will take all of this seriously. I also have a family member of my own now, and I don't want them to hear about any of it. I have to be careful, because I don't want to expose my children to these kind of images slash thoughts. Lastly, I would like to just add for those who question as to whether or not my thought process about this situation are, um, stable. I had to be psychologically assessed as part of the legal requirements when I had charges pressed against my stepbrother. The courts need to assure that the person making those kinds of allegations are mentally aware of their accusations, and that there is no sign of mental illness where they may have misinterpreted the situation. Yes. There are psychological effects. I suffer from PTSD. But honestly, if you knew the true horrors of the home that I grew up in, then you would be amazed if anyone could endure such an upbringing and walk out of that home without any emotional baggage. If anyone who reads this knows of a person amongst the Victorian Police Task Force who would be interested in talking with me, I have no problem with this and would appreciate a way to contact them. As I type this, I'm sitting here shaking. As I recall my old home and what those poor girls had to endure, and poor Carmen, who probably did nothing wrong other than view his face, my heart goes out to her family. But I'm so scared that her family would bear a grudge towards me, even though I had nothing to do with the whole situation.
and was the same age as their Carmen. Grief can make someone view perspectives differently. I would be ashamed to face them, unless I was able to assist them in getting some kind of justice. I have not mentioned any names other than that of Carmen Chan, who is one of his victims. I have not mentioned exact suburbs or exact information, as if this is of interest to the police, I don't want to jeopardize any possible investigation and outcome by posting information publicly before an official investigation is done, nor do I want to cause any possible bias opinions, as this could affect the outcome of a court hearing. I'm not saying that my step-family members will ever be charged or go to court, or that they're definitely guilty but I will not take the risk of ruining any chances of possible justice just so I can tell my story on Reddit. Thank you for reading. Perhaps someone will respond with some kind of information or advice. Update 1. Thank you, fellow Redditors, for your prompt advice. I have reposted this on r slash Cruel, which I didn't even know existed, and have given permission for another Redditor to post on r slash Melbourne. As I have not mentioned any names or exact locations that could cause a biased opinion or hint at a definite identity of someone I think may be involved, then the more coverage this post gets, the more likely I will be able to get into contact with someone who may be able to assist in either taking this post to the next level, contact with someone within the correct task force, or help alleviate some of my fears. I'm good with either one. So, thanks for the help slash advice. Update 2. Hi, fellow Redditors. I just wanted to make a quick note. I welcome anyone who questions timelines, etc., and is helping me by constructively pointing out any possible inconsistencies. I have been, and am, avoiding doing any research about the cold case, because I don't want to subconsciously blend my childhood memories with new information that I learn online. Except for the composite sketch that I viewed, and the mock-ups of a bedroom and bathroom, I have not read any information about this case at all. Everything I have mentioned is based on the memories of an 11-year-old child from over 30 years ago, so there's most likely going to be some points that I may remember incorrectly, or remember them from the point of view as a child. Considering that I have refused to view any information about this cold case, the information I have supplied is all based on memories about what I recall viewing on the media slash news from my childhood. I did originally mention that my stepfather would shush me and turn the television up, so I was exposed to the media at the time that it was current, and also based on memories of what I recall was going on in my home environment at the time. I appreciate everyone who has read my post, and I thank everyone who has commented, replied, or questioned what information I have provided. So, thank you again to all of you. The response here has been somewhat overwhelming, but greatly appreciated. I do try to read and respond to every comment posted, but I have become lost amongst them a few times, so I apologize if I miss anyone, or take a bit longer to respond than what I normally would. I did not realize I would get a response as large as what I have. I'm truly grateful to everyone involved, and the support has been amazing. So that was just one story. Just one story by a Redditor who believes that their stepfather or stepbrother may be the uh, elusive Mr. Cruel in Australia. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, obviously, I'm not going to state my opinions. I will say the uh, circumstances with which they are making their deductions are pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty well thought out, and pretty convincing. Um, I don't believe the Mr. Cruel case has ever been solved at this point in time, I'll have to verify that, but uh, if it was this person's family, someone in the family, um, that would be horrible, 
and to the original poster of the story, I do apologize that you had to go through this, and I'm very sorry that um, that was your childhood, and that even now that childhood is not letting you move on and move past, because obviously there's um, potential connections or similarities to one of the worst things to happen in, Aust in the, I believe the Tasmanian, Australian, uh, Victorian, those areas. Um, being from the U.S., I don't really know the areas very well, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so again, thank you to the original poster for letting me read this story, and thank you to everyone who listens. If you enjoyed it, please do hit that thumbs up button. If you're new, consider subscribing to the channel, and of course, you can always support further through joining the channel memberships down below, or going to patreon.com slash asthereavendreams. All of it optional, all of it greatly appreciated. I'm not gonna push on too much harder into this, just uh, again, one more thank you to everybody. And I hope you have a lovely day, and I hope I'll see you on the next video. But until then, sleep well.